So for today's lecture, we're going to be looking at tissue properties, and particularly we're going to be looking at that through the window of the neuromusculoskeletal system. If you'd like, you can follow along with additional optional readings in Raymond's text, pages 37 through 48. Additionally, there are multiple objectives that can guide your overview and ensure you're taking away some of the important uh, information from the next few slides. As we begin, let's start with a little bit of introduction. When we're looking at the human body, we have predominantly four types of tissue. We have connective tissue, we have epithelial tissue that makes up our integument system, our skin, and then we have muscular tissue and nervous tissue, right? And when we're looking at the impact of injury, that is going to impact, typically in a negative way, the function and the interaction of the cells that make up these different types of tissues. Now, the causes of those injuries can be a variety of things. They can be chemical, there can be mechanical, nutritional, pathogenic, thermal, even radioactive causes that would lead to injury of these specific tissue subsets. Now, when we're talking about neuromuscular injuries, this can further include what we would classify as contractile tissue versus non-contractile tissue, right? And within those areas, we have connective tissue. That is um, the individual tissue that is helping to keep all of this together. We have tendons, we have ligaments, we have cartilage, nerve, muscle, right? And so oftentimes we refer to these as soft tissue injuries. Now, to give us a little bit more information on what classifies contractile versus non-contractile tissue, we need to think about does it have a, a contractile component? There's only two tissues that fall under the categorization of contractile tissue. That's muscle and tendon. Now, tendon in and of itself is not a contractile property. It doesn't possess that. But because tendon attaches the muscle to the bone, and when muscle contracts, it pulls on the tendon, thereby initiating movement, we lump both muscle and tendon together as a contractile tissue. All other tissue is non-contractile tissue. When we then talk about injury classifications, we really think of it in terms of macrotraumatic or microtraumatic events. And these can be further uh, categorized as primary versus secondary. Macrotraumatic events are single event episodes where load exceeds the capacity or the tolerance of the tissue in that moment. You can think of this as being self-inflicted. It could be the result of circumstance. It could be environmental, but it leads to and results in a fracture, dislocation, rupture of ligament. Um, and typically we know what that event was, right? They fell. There was a motor vehicle accident. They were hit from the side, so on and so forth. In a microtraumatic event, microtraumatic events are typically inflammatory processes that are potentially occurring within a primary injury, or they are occurring with a cumulative effect. And so often we don't know the event. Oftentimes we'll hear patients and clients say, this kind of came on out of nowhere, and we say it's insidious. And so oftentimes we think of these as perhaps being chronic or overuse overload injuries, where there's repetitive overloading that over time exceeds tissue tolerance. And so it's not a single event, rather it's a cumulative or compounding events, plural. And examples of this may be a tendinopathy, a bone stress injury. Okay. When we are looking at these types of injuries, rarely is load the issue. Rather, it's the load that the client or the patient was not adequately prepared for. If I take a client and I have them back squat 500 pounds, and they've never back squat that kind of weight before, the likelihood of injury, whether that's macrotraumatic or microtraumatic, is very high. Okay? But if over time, years, through a model of graded exposure, I prepare that individual for that load, it's highly unlikely they're going to be injured. Now, whether or not they want to be prepared for that load is a completely different question. But the body is very adaptable. And when a stimulus is imposed, oftentimes we see that adaptation take place. Part of how that adaptation takes place is through stress. Now, what does stress look like to you? 
Maybe it's studying for an exam or for this class. Maybe it's the stress of relationships, whether they're new or ongoing. Maybe stress is emotional stress, psychological stress. It feels like a ball and chain. Or maybe stress is stress that's being applied for adaptive purposes. Stress can be classified as good. We typically think of that as eustress or bad. We think of that as maladaptive stress. But the main takeaway here is that tissue stress is normal. The body and the tissues associated with the body undergo stress within activities of daily living on a day-to-day -day basis. The very fact that you're walking around in a gravity-dependent position means that your body is seeing stress. You're experiencing friction. You're experiencing a ground reaction force uh, because you're experiencing ground contact time. Stress is a normal thing. There's all kinds of kinetics that are acting upon the body. So when we think of stress, it's not that stress is a bad thing. Rather, it's the context around the stress that matters. If there's excessive or repetitive stress, maybe we're incurring a bone stress injury, a fracture, or a stress fracture. If there's not enough stress, if there's not enough load, as we get older, we deal with atrophy and muscle wasting and sarcopenia and osteopenia, maybe even osteoporosis. So we need, we need a balance of stress. Too much, not a great thing. Too little, not a great thing. And so when we think of stress, particularly within the context of the neuromusculoskeletal system, we think of it in this definition, directly related to the magnitude of force and inversely related to the unit area. Whereas strain, we're going to define that as well as the change in length of a material due to an imposed load divided by the original length. So we can have linear strain where we see a change in the length of a structure, or we can have shear strain which is a change in the angular relationships with a structure. Now, what does all that mean? Well, if we have an original shape, this is a sphere, and we apply shear force or shear strain, right? This is perpendicular to the structure, to our original shape. And certain structures are pretty good at tolerating that. Others are not great at that. Think of a bone, for example, right? and we look at compression and tension. Bones are really good at compression. They're even okay at tension. If you apply a shear force to bone, not a good thing. And so each tissue is going to respond to load differently. Bone likes compression, does not like shear forces, right? Cartilage, pretty decent at compression, not so good at tension, doesn't like shear force. And how we react, how our tissues react to these different types of forces and strain is also going to be impacted by our past history in, uh, as it relates to injury, our age, overall health and wellness, if it's macro versus micro load, how an individual at the age of 15 versus the age of 50 versus the age of 90 reacts to the exact same force is vastly different, and it's based on overall tissue tolerance, their age, their history. Now, stress can be a good thing. If we think of stress through a said principle where said is specific adaptation to impose demand, that's a good thing. When we go out and we exercise, we're hoping that we get a specific adaptation. If I go out and I go for a run, I'm hoping I get better at running. If I go out and I lift weights, I'm hoping that I get better at tolerating load and so exercises then can be used to change the properties of the tissue, whether that's muscle, tendon, ligament, as it relates to external load. And when strength improves, it's a direct result from an increase in proteoglycan content and collagen cross-linking. The more collagen cross-linking that you have, the stronger the tissue is. Now, stress also leads to adaptive changes in bone. And this is a great example of Wolf's Law. Adaptation is based upon load. If you've ever seen someone who is a martial artist and they repeatedly punch a piece of wood or a brick, how are they able to not break their knuckles? It's because their body, their bone, is specifically adapt adapting to the imposed demand of that trauma. 
Now, what happens when failure results? Failure can be seen on a stress strain curve. We previously defined stress, load, and strain. The failure would be the maladaptive result of stress. And that occurs when deformations exceed the ultimate failure point and produce a mechanical failure of the structure. Now, when we think of our stress strain curve, stress is force divided by area, whereas strain is tissue deformation. And so at the beginning, our stress is beginning to slowly increase. We call that the toe region. We're taking up slack. And then we get into the elastic region. It's linear. This is physiological range. Our tissues are well adapted to tolerate this type of stress, this type of load. But if we continue, we move beyond that, we can get into what's called the plastic range. And what separates the elastic from the plastic range is what we call the yield point. And it's at this point that we begin to lose some of the mechanical properties of the tissue. If you have ever worked out a tissue, a muscle, and then you've tried to use it after, you know that your use of that tissue has been compromised. You've lost some of the mechanical properties. Now, if you continue to push, you will go over the cliff to the point of failure. And that's complete failure. That is where deformation occurs. And it's at that point that loss of function is complete as well. Now, What's going to lead to that point of loss of function? What's going to lead to that point of injury in the aspect of microtrauma? Right? It's when there is not predictable exposure to load. It's when we're not within that physiologic range, but instead we're moving beyond our capacity and then we're deficiently loading as well. When someone is engaged in activity, when they are training, when they're exercising, we don't want their exercise program to look like an EKG where it's all over the place. We want them to stay within a sweet spot, a Goldilocks zone, where there is appropriate remodeling that's taking place. They're not exceeding the capacity of the tissue or the tolerance of the tissue, but they're also not deficient to the load that's required to bring about meaningful adaptation. And so how do we build this appropriate remodeling? How do we build this appropriate exercise and this appropriate load? Well, it's a combination of a variety of things. We need time, we need magnitude, and we need force. Time is duration, volume, repetition, the rate. Magnitude is the amount of stress that's placed upon a tissue. And the direction of force is compression, shear, torsion, tension, what is happening to that tissue? And if we want to bring about improvement in, improvements in the tolerance to stress, we have to be mindful of these areas. If we're not mindful, if we are haphazard, if we are hoping that meaningful response and adaptation is going to take place, then oftentimes we are risking injury. And so now let's pivot and let's discuss injury. How does injury occur? What occurs once an injury has taken place? How do we classify injuries? There is a lot of different schemas to classify injuries. What we're going to use is an acute, subacute, and persistent or chronic classification. And so in an acute injury, this indicates that we are in the early phase of injury and healing, and this lasts up to approximately five days. This is that 24 to 72 hour typically phase where you get the classic signs of inflammation and we'll review those momentarily. The subacute phase typically lasts from about five days up to 10 days. It can last as long as 21 days. And we think, so we think of this as kind of being that uh, one week up to a month phase. And it follows the acute phase. 
This is where we get the disposal of dead tissue. Fibroblasts are mobilized to the area uh, in order to, to, to clot and, and start the process of healing. Circulation is restored. And so this is that proliferative phase. There's lots of cells moving to the area of injury. Finally, we get into the persistent, sometimes referred to as chronic, though chronic has perhaps a, a negative connotation. Persistent meaning that it's ongoing. And this is the final stage of healing that occurs. Now, this begins around 26 to 34 days, which is why subacute can last up to about a month, but it could take up to a year or more for remodeling to complete its process. Think of an ACL pathology. If someone has undergone ACL tear and then reconstruction, they return to sport typically around a year to 15 months, but it can take up to two years before the ACL is complete in its remodeling phase, even though it's typically um, considered a return to strength at approximately one year. This takes time, and there's nothing that we can do to speed the process up. There's a lot that we can do to optimize, and there's a whole lot that we can do to slow it down, but there's nothing that we can do to speed it up or accelerate it. Now, there are some injuries that have what are called acute on chronic presentations, where there is a chronic problem, a persistent problem that is ongoing, but there are these acute flares. And we typically see this in tendons, and we'll talk about that more um, as we progress. Now, with tissue injury, it is a part of life. You're going to get injured. Fact. And the older you are, the more likely that injury is going to occur. And so there's this linear relationship that exists. If you're under the age of 34, about a 10% chance that you're going to incur a soft tissue injury. Now, that's just in daily life. If you engage in certain sports or activities, pastimes, hobbies, obviously things go up. But as you get Above the age of 75%, 32 to 49% of individuals are going to incur a soft tissue injury, essentially one in two. Now, how can you kind of build up your robustness and quote unquote bulletproof yourself? Not a fan of the term, but some people will use it against tissue injury. Healthy tissues better resist injury. And so age certainly is a factor. We see that with the relationship above. Concentration of proteoglycans and collagens, a factor that has huge implications. Tissue adaptability, mechanism of injury. If you engage in certain activities that are more likely to increase your mechanism of injury, you're more likely to incur an injury. If I'm on division and I'm going 75 miles an hour versus following the speed limit at 30 or 35 miles an hour, I'm more likely to incur a motor vehicle accident and experience injury. So there are things that just increase our overall risk. Now, once an injury has occurred, the very first phase is inflammation. We don't skip phases and, and, and advance to a proliferative phase or um, remodeling phase. We go through these phases in a linear fashion, and so inflammation comes first. What happens with inflammation? It is a normal response. I'm going to say that again. It is a normal response. As a matter of fact, you need inflammation. It's the first step in the tissue healing cascade. And it actually sends out signals to the rest of the body to begin to mount a chemical and a cellular response. It helps to destroy any type of uh, pathogen that might be exposed to the body. It helps to dilute it or wall it off so that it doesn't have a bigger impact on the body than what would be natural. Healing needs inflammation. And so a post-inflammatory process that represents the effect, efforts of the organism to restore tissue integrity and function after damage is how we define healing. Now, it's either going to occur by regeneration where we regrow the original tissue or repair, and that's where scar tissue comes in. Oftentimes, it's through scar tissue. Once you have damaged your bone, you are going to regrow bone, but you're going to have a scar. If you cut your skin, you're likely to have a scar. You are regrowing epithelial cells, but there is connective tissue and scar formation that also occurs. Now, you need a bunch of different types of cellular responses and cellular mechanisms for this to occur. You need blood vessels and cells, you need connective tissues, and the chemical mediators that get released from inflammatory cells, and those signal a process known as chemotaxis. But with inflammation, you're going to get some things that maybe you don't want as well. So even though it's a normal and necessary process, 
it also involves a vascular, humoral, and cellular response. And when those occur, we get things like redness and swelling and pain and things are hot to the touch. We might even lose function. When these are prolonged, when inflammation lasts longer than it should beyond those five days, up to about a week, it's not a good thing. We don't want prolonged inflammation. And unfortunately, in folks that suffer from autoimmune disorders, that's one of the things that they suffer from is these inflammatory flares where these symptoms prolong for a long period of time. Chronic inflammation associated with autoimmune disorders or just chronic inflammation in general is not a good thing. It's a prolonged, dysregulated, and maladaptive response that involves active inflammation, tissue destruction, and attempts at tissue repair. Persistent inflammation that is associated with chronic human conditions and diseases, including allergies and atherosclerosis, cancer, arthritis, and autoimmune diseases. We don't want inflammation to stick around. It's a perfectly normal and healthy process but it needs to then lead to the next phase, which is the proliferative phase, the subacute phase. And so when our body is first dealing with injury, we get the breaking of the blood vessels. There is going to be some element of cell death that results in damage to the extracellular elements. And because of that, blood loss is controlled by vasoconstriction. Clot formation occurs very, very quickly, within five to 10 minutes. If you ever had a bloody nose, you know that if you kind of tip your head back, you pinch uh, just above kind of the nasal uh, cavity, um, you can begin to allow fibrin uh, formation, fibroblasts to, to clot together, and that will stop the loss of, of blood through vasoconstriction. That then leads to the formulation of granulation tissues, and this is the healing tissue. This is the tissue that's then going to lead to, it's a transient tissue, it leads to whatever those subtypes are. So for example, granulation tissue is going to uh, lead to collagen. Now it doesn't just become type 1 collagen, it has to be remodeled. So at first it becomes type 3 co collagen, and then it's going to be matured and it's going to become type 1 collagen. And again, that process is going to take time, but we need granulation tissue first. Now, once that clot has formed and, and blood loss, bleeding out is no longer risk, then the body's going to vasodilate, does the exact opposite. And the reason it does that is to try to increase blood supply to the area where we get this sympathetic response that's lost, and then the vessels dilate, and it brings all the other things that are necessary in, right? And so this has a sum or a net effect known as edema. It's the sum of all the vascular changes. And so we get swelling. This is where all of a sudden now white blood cells have come in, neutrophils and monocytes and macrophages, right? That viscosity of the blood begins to change because plasma leaks out of the vessel and results in this, what we call hemoconcentration. Uh, and so edema, swelling, is going to occur. Now, Edema and swelling has a protective function. It means that we're not going to use the limb as much. It kind of serves as a brace for the joint or, or that area. It also kind of reminds us, hey, injury, you probably shouldn't use this area as much. Now, we need to be careful with the term here. Edema is not the same as a hematoma. Hematoma is blood that collects outside of a blood vessel. Edema, not all the components of blood. It's just very specific, very select components of the inflammatory response. Now, over time, we're going to get removal of that exudate, predominantly through the lymphatics. But that takes time. Lymphatics are very, very, very small. If you can imagine a lymphatic vessel, it's about the size of a fishing line. right? So there's not a lot of, of fluid that's going to move within that. And the exudate has different components and they move at different speeds. So for example, serous is mild injury, mild inflammation. That's going to resolve fairly quickly. Uh, fibrinous, more severe inflammation, higher protein content, doesn't move very well. And then if it's purulent exudate, where there is a high risk of uh, infection, but this is really rich in white blood cells, neutrophils, and macrophages. Uh, this is the most viscous, and it takes a really long time for the body to kind of move those particles away. And so the more infected a joint or a wound is, an injury is, the more white blood cells are going to be attracted to the area, and the longer healing is going to take, right? So think about this for just a second. What population, subpopulation of patients would negatively be impacted by this phase of injury and healing? We'll talk about that a little bit more, but I want you to spend a little bit of time thinking about that. 
Now, there's a lot of other chemical mediators that are involved within the inflammatory process. Keep in mind, histamine, very active in folks that suffer from allergies. Uh, platelet activating factor is made primarily of white blood cells. Uh, we have arachidonic acid. We have cytokines, interleukin-1. Uh, we go into interleukin-6 and others, and, and these are uh, big-time uh, impactors in chronic diseases. Things like tumor necrosis factor, uh, even these other uh, interrelated enzymes. Okay, All of these are chemical mediators that are attracted by the inflammatory response. They arrive via a process of chemotaxis, and then they begin to take over and fight the infection or um, stabilize kind of the overall response. Now, some of the cellular mediators, neutrophils arrive first. They're the most important of any of the white blood cells. They surround and engulf any type of bacteria or, or uh, danger to the body. Then macrophages uh, come next. They're in the second wave. Uh, they're longer lived. Again, they can help to kind of attract other things that are going to help with the healing process and, and also um, help begin the process of, of replacing the damaged tissue. Now, these are part of the inflammatory process. Typically during inflammation, we see a heavy use of NSAIDs. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Recognizing that inflammation is a normal, healthy response that leads to all these cellular mediators and all of these different vascular responses should NSAIDs be used within the early inflammatory phase. It's a question we got to think about. It's a question we'll answer shortly. Now, Regardless of how the injury occurs, if it's traumatic, atraumatic, macrotraumatic, microtraumatic, primary, secondary, there's going to be a response to injury. Ideally, we get regeneration. That's an optimal outcome. It's where the cells are replaced with identical cells. Doesn't always occur that way. Normal repair is where connective tissue is going to be laid down. Now, it's not synonymous with regeneration. It does result in healing, but it's not with the same cells. Now, we can have injuries that never heal, heal poorly, or heal too much. Examples of that, neoplasia, tumors, uncontrolled cell division, those are, those are pathologies that don't heal. Wounds that don't heal well are things like ulcers, whether that's cutaneous, decubitus, pressure, diabetic ulcers, and they don't heal well because the blood supply is compromised. There's some other pathology that is compromising the overall integrity of the system. And then we have wounds that heal too much. There's an overhealing response. That's not good either. We need a balance, right? Things like keloid scars, cutaneous lesions, even third-degree burns where there's lots of scar tissue formation. And so the clinical application of all of this is that when we're dealing with an injury and we're moving through these phases, first of all, it is normal. Second of all, we need these to occur. The inflammatory phase, super important. There's a chemical response that occurs and we can do things to help minimize the negative effects, but we're not going to stop inflammation from occurring. Things that we can do, price, protect, rest, ice, compress, elevate, and meme or MEM, manual therapy, early motion, and medication. Medication, put a question mark by that. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. There's a time and a place for it. We move to the proliferative phase. Somewhat modifiable. But this is where we can start doing movements, things like active recovery, range of motion, isometrics. And then finally, the remodeling phase or the persistent phase. This is where interventions really are in the it depends category because it depends on what the symptoms are, what tissue is affected, bone versus ligament versus tendon versus muscle, so on and so forth. What's the clinical parole here? The idea of progressive load overload is commonly referred to as graded exposure. And so hopefully you see here a model of graded exposure. We're not doing a lot of contraction, a lot of body weight stuff in the inflammatory phase. We're not doing sub-max concentric eccentrics in the proliferative phase. We're grading the exposure over time. This is a helpful graphic that shows what we've been talking about, what happens at the point of injury from an inflammatory, uh, proliferative, and even remodeling phase as it relates to nervous tissue, bone, even cutaneous tissue. So uh, this is more or less for your records and to give you a little bit of application of what we've been talking about. Now, when we're discussing different types of tissue regeneration, keep in mind, it doesn't happen immediately. 
right? And so uh, we first have to lay down those early progenitor forms of tissue. And so when we're talking about type of collagen, type one is the strongest. This is where we have bone and ligament and tendon. But it's going to take a while to get there. Type three collagen is going to be laid down first, and then that has to be remodeled and reformed before it becomes type one collagen. And so while it is the best, so to speak, in terms of the resiliency, the strength, it also takes a really long time to get back to that level. So that is the normal process. And this is a, this is very much a 30,000 foot view. We are giving a broad general overview of the process of tissue pathology and the cascade of healing. Next, I want to give you a couple examples of this applied to some of the different types of tissues that we see within the human body. Now, each one of these varies. When we think of good prognosis to not good prognosis, bone is the best. Next come muscle, tendon, ligament, and nerve. Why do you think bone is so good at the healing process, whereas nerves, not so great? Somebody fractures their arm, they're casted, and within six to eight weeks, they're back to it. If somebody breaks, ligates, severs a spinal cord, could be a permanent life-altering pathology. Why don't nerves heal so well? One big clue is blood supply. Nerves don't have great blood supply. Bones, phenomenal blood supply. Also the type of tissue, right? Why is the bones heal so gosh darn well? Well, osteoblast, progenitor cells, do a really good job becoming bone. We're talking about tendon. We got to get back to type 1 collagen. Well, that takes a while. And so it's a, an elongated healing process. So how then do we completely mitigate the risk of injury? Well, we can't. But we can, we can reduce it. When I say mitigate, I'm meaning can we prevent injury? We can't prevent it, but we can reduce it. How can we do that? Well, Malachi McHugh, who is a researcher out of New York City, makes the following claim. The analogy that injuries in sports are as random as being hit by lightning is apt, but with one caveat. Measurable risk factors can be identified for most injuries. Ignoring those risk factors is akin to allowing an athlete to walk into a lightning storm holding a metal pole above his or her head. We don't want to send athletes and clients out into whatever the context of load, life, is with a metal pole above their head. We want to be mindful of risk factors. And so we're going to discuss what some of those risk factors are as it relates to different types of tissues as we go. The other thing that we want to be mindful of is that along with injury, pain is often experienced. And developing an understanding of pain is being discriminatory between is this a stop sign, meaning do not proceed, stop, no more, or a yield sign. And a yield sign is proceed with caution. Well, it depends on the type of pain we're experiencing and its correlation to injury. We can have a bunch of different scenarios. We can have no pain and no tissue injury. That's great. Green light. Train as hard as you want. We can have no pain and tissue injury. We just aren't maybe aware of it. Or maybe we are, and it's not really threatening. We can have pain and no tissue injury. And this really leaves us scratching our heads because we're going, where did the pain come from? If not from an injured tissue. And then we can have pain and tissue injury. Now we're going to discuss pain more as we go throughout this semester and next, but recognize pain is part of the injury process, but it's not necessary for injury to have occurred. So as we go through each one of these tissues, um, I'm going to lay out a little bit of a process of, of how, we, how we classify it, what we can expect, um, even uh, what the healing cascade looks like. And we're going to look at each one of these individually, first starting with muscle. Now, the influence to performance comes from a variety of things, age, temperature, immobility, or disuse. Um, if you don't use it, you will lose it. That's a process of sarcopenia. And as you get older, muscle becomes less uh, tolerant to different types of strain and load and, and overall function becomes compromised. Injury then is influenced by 
a variety of things, excessive strain, contusions, lacerations, might even be influenced by stress, the use of corticosteroids, myotoxic agents, even delayed onset muscle soreness. Primarily, it's excessive strain, though. Over 90% of injuries to muscle are due to excessive strain. And those factors that contribute to that may be due to flexibility restrictions, uh, an overall reduction in capacity. Again, load is not the issue. It's the load that they were unprepared for or ill-prepared for. Maybe they did not in, uh, uh, fully rehab their last uh, injury, and so there was inadequate rehabilitation. There wasn't enough recovery. Or they have dyssynergistic muscle contraction. And so then when we look at muscle pathology, we really look at it across a three-degree scale. Now, there's a couple different scales and a different, couple different schemes uh, that work to classify muscle. If we think of this in terms of first-degree injury, this is minimal structural damage. Hemorrhaging really hasn't occurred. It's typically going to resolve fairly early. Some even include delayed onset muscle soreness in this area, though some also pull it out and say it's grade zero. So there's some debate there. But we're not going to see a loss of muscle performance. We can still train. Now, if we stretch, we elongate and place tension across that tissue, it could be a little bit of pain, but overall, performance is still possible. With a second degree tear, this is considered a partial tear. Large spectrum encompasses a lot of injury. Now we start to see functional loss. If an individual has a partial thickness rotator cuff tear, for example, we're going to see strength deficits. We're going to see range of motion deficits. They're going to begin to exhibit diminished performance, and pain is likely to be reproduced. In a second-degree situation, they are at a greatest risk for reoccurrence to, to, to move forward. Approximately 24% or 1 in 4 are going to occur, are going to reoccur at this phase. Our third degree is our complete tear. So loss of function, significant increase in pain, though potentially not always. There are some folks that have a third degree tear, but it is persistent or chronic, and they have lost function, but they've also then lost their pain. There, there is no pain, right? And these often require surgical consultation. Now, there's lots of classification. There is a British athletic muscle injury classification. There's what's known as the MLGR classification by Valle et al., where they look at mechanism, location, grading, and the number of re-injuries that they've occurred. So just recognize you may be exposed to a variety of schemes um, and ideas as it relates to grading these. Now, again, um, I mentioned sometimes delayed onset muscle soreness gets pulled out right? It's its own thing. It's it's a grade of zero. And it typically is an onset following unaccustomed activity. And typically of an eccentric variety. And so you end up with muscle cell cell damage, but you haven't really compromised the overall function of the tissue. Yeah, it hurts. But the more you expose yourself to that activity, it's unlikely that it's to occur again. So then we have our strains, first, second, and third, which we just discussed. And then we can also have contusions. Now, contusions are a little bit different than strains. Contusions occur with a direct blow, typically a perpendicular blow that leads to not necessarily edema, but a hematoma. Right? Where we have trauma and tearing of the fibers proportionate to the severity, and so it could be a strain. So just keep that in mind. There are some different terminologies uh, that we may wish to uh, be mindful of. Now, when healing is progressing within muscle, it's very much a multifactorial prognosis. Muscle has significant regenerative ability, but healing still depends on blood supply and rehab and modifiable versus non-modifiable factors, which we'll discuss momentarily it's going to go through phases. Now, we talked about phases of inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. This is similar, right? We're going to end up with destruction of tissue. That's, that's the mechanism of injury and also the inflammatory process. And the risk for atrophy is very high in this phase. As the proliferative phase begins and we see repair occurring, we're going to end up with what's called the synthesizing of the extracellular matrix. Now, the extracellular matrix is really important. That extracellular matrix comes from fibroblasts, and the fibroblasts begin to develop collagen fibers that are going to lead to the regeneration of the striated muscle. This occurs, again, within that first week of healing as we move from the inflammatory to the subacute phase or the proliferative phase. Over time, remodeling is going to take place, and we're going to transition from type 3 to type 1 collagen and back to actual 
muscle fibers. Now, with muscle injury, again, I said extracellular matrix is really important. That extracellular matrix is going to give mechanical structure to the myofibers that are going to then link to the tendon and help to transmit force. And so this is where we see our epimysium, paramysium, and endomysium, and it's linked to prognosis. The more extracellular matrix you have, the better. So how can we help to promote? I mentioned a moment ago, uh, there's not much that we can do to speed up the process, but there's a lot that we can do to optimize the process. And what we can do in this phase is a lot of things associated with price. We can protect the area. We can rest it, ice it, compress it, elevate it, and then slowly begin to expose the tissue to graded mobility. But notice, we're not putting it under a high amount of tension. We're not rushing to failure. Muscle strains are mechanosensitive structures. They convert force into biomechanical signals. Biomechanical signals create cellular responses, which help to restore homeostasis. This isn't something that's rushed. And if you overload the system too early, you're going to create a suboptimal recovery and rehabilitation. So it's critical to understand this when you're, when you're designing a return to play and rehabilitation plan of care. If you overload the tissue too early, and you create mechanical forces under suboptimal conditions, you're going to create setback and you're going to prolong the healing phase. Now, there are multiple risk factors for muscle strains. Some are modifiable. Those are things that are within your control. Some are non-modifiable, meaning you can't change those, and some have no influence whatsoever. Modifiable risk factors are things like muscle weakness and imbalance. I mentioned earlier ACL uh, tears. One of the big ones that we know impacts the risk of an ACL tear is something called quad to hamstring ratio, also referred to as limb symmetry index. If your hamstrings are incredibly weak and your quads are incredibly strong and, and there is a difference from right to left, meaning your symmetry index of your limbs is disproportionate, your risk of ACL pathology increases significantly. If you're fatigued, higher risk of injury. When do ACL injuries typically occur. They typically occur very early on in match play or in, in um, uh, a game scenario, or they occur at the end when you're fatigued. What about flexibility, poor coordination? Those are also modifiable and they contribute to muscle strains, but also tendon and ligament strains. Things that are non-modifiable, you have no control over this. How old you are? You have no control over a prior history of injury. If you've had an ACL injury, you've had an ACL injury. Done. There are a cascade of changes that occur with that, right? We can't change your sex, male versus female. We know that individuals are at a much higher risk for ACL pathology if they're female versus male. We can't necessarily change the surface of the sport either. ACL pathology occurs a lot more on a hardwood surface and on turf than it does in grass. There's a whole host of reasons why that occurs, and we'll talk about that as things progress, but that also plays a role. Now, interestingly enough, what does not influence this? Your height doesn't influence this, your weight doesn't influence this, and your BMI doesn't influence this. So these are, these are non-factors. So where do we spend our time from a rehabilitation standpoint? We spend it on modifiable risk factors because these are things that we can actually control. We can't do anything about this in many circumstances. Control the controllables. If you have a muscle pathology, what do you do for treatment? Uh, this was a great article that was published um, uh, in British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2020. And they have a great acronym for this, peace and love. You protect it, you elevate it, you avoid NSAIDs, you compress, and you educate. You load it, facilitate optimal recovery. You uh, help to restore blood flow through vascularization. And over time, you restore mobility through a graded exposure and model of exercise. We will talk more about this as we go, but this is a great way to kind of remember what it is that's going to lead to and foster recovery of muscle tissue. Let's pivot now and talk about this second type of tissue that is contractile, that is tendon. Tendon is injuries can occur in a variety of ways. You can have an insertional uh, tendon pathology, a mid-portion uh, or central tendon injury, um, and even an injury at the muscular tendinous junction. Central tendon injuries have poor outcomes. It's not great. 
Okay. The injury leads to disorganization of collagen fibers. You can end up with tenocyte formation that's rounded, uh, reduced loading capacity, very common to have what's called an acute on chronic pathology, where there are persistent symptoms within the tendon with these acute flares based on exposure to load. And factors affecting the risk of injury are very similar to what we saw with muscle pathology, age, hormone levels, antibiotics, uh, specifically fluoroquinolones, um, corticosteroid use, load, either the, the history uh, too much load or the absence of load. Not a great thing. Okay. And with tendons, we typically, instead of kind of uh, framing it from a, uh, a first degree, second degree, third degree, we say that it's a tendinopathy. It's a pathology of the tendon. Now there are various types. Tendinitis, if we use that root word, itis, that typically means an inflammatory and acute inflammatory condition. It's rare to see this, in all honesty. The vast majority of tendon pathology is a tendinosis. It's more persistent. We can even have a, a naming convention that gives us some clue as to where this is occurring. Is it mid-portion? Is it at a, an insertional location? That's what's referred to as an enthesopathy. Or we can have peritendinitis, which has subcategorizations of tino and peritendinitis. It's, it's inflammation of the synovial sheath. Now, a little bit of semantics here, okay? But recognize that there are different naming conventions and they mean and, and have uh, implications uh, that are going to vary in terms of how you approach this. Again, we're going to unpack this as we get into each domain and area over the course of the next two semesters. But when we're talking about tendon, when there is an injury, it compromises the ability of the transmission of force between bone and muscle. Again, the tendon is what is connecting the muscle to the bone at the insertional point. For it to stay healthy, homeostasis is then maintained through mechanotransduction and the response to mechanical load. You got to load it on a fairly regular basis. Shear, not a good thing. Okay, so compressive versus tension load, that's, that's a good thing, right? Now, you can also have kind of an overlap with a muscle pathology, and that would be a strain injury, and that's common at the musculotendinous junction. But a lot of what tendon pathology uh, is is mid-portion and insertional. And what ends up happening is they are friction and compressive injuries where the tendon is pinched or irritated around a point of compression. And then that leads to collagen disorganization and disorientation, fiber separation. There's an increase in proteoglycans, increase in water content, um, and, and we then result in poor strength, power, muscle wasting, altered movement patterns. It's not a good scenario. So when we're talking about a tendinopathy, we're defining that as overload of a tendon that has led to a degenerative condition. Typically, it's an osis, right? In contrast with an itis, which would be an inflammatory condition. Again, this can occur in a variety of locations. It can be insertional. It can affect the bursa. Those are common. Um, and the tendon proper itself is, is rather aneural and avascular. And so what that leads to is a very prolonged healing response. Now, if it's a tendinosis, again, uh, this is where we get that collagen disorganization and hypercellularity. If it's peritonitis, this would be inflammation of the sheath, this is where we get localized swelling and, again, an inflammatory response. The grades of tendon pathology um, typically are about five. Uh, these are less important, but it's good to know that these exist. Grade one would be pain only after activity. Uh, grade two is minimal pain with activity. Does not really interfere with things. This would be associated with like a, a, an itis. Uh, grade three, pain interferes with activity. There's localized tenderness. Now we're moving into more persistent. Uh, grade four, doesn't dissipate with rest. And grade five, pain interferes with all activities. They're chronic, right? The other thing that's interesting about tendons is that their overall metabolic rate is far lower. They are 7.5 times lower in terms of their consumption of oxygen, the muscle. So it's very, very slow. And the blood vessels do not extend beyond the proximal third of the tendon similar to like um, uh, cartilage uh, and meniscus within the knee, uh, poor, poor blood supply.
And so again, the healing response is going to be blunted. So typically when we're talking about tendons then, we know the healing response is blunted. And so we begin to track what's known as a 24-hour pattern. What's their stiffness? What's their pain? How does it react uh, from periods of rest versus periods of movement? Interestingly enough, one of the hallmarks of a tendon pathology is what's known as a warming phase. When you first get up, it hurts. It doesn't like to move. It's stiff. The more you move it, the better it gets. But you can over move it, overload it, and then it's going to get worse again. So that warming phase is when it moves from a pattern of stiffness to it begins to warm up. It feels a little bit better. And there's these overlapping phases that are going on throughout all of this. Uh, inflammatory and remodeling and repair are occurring. Um, and it takes a while. Again, tendon strength typically does not become fully restored for up to a year. Tendons are similar to ligaments. And again, that's a 30,000 foot view of tendons. There's a lot more that we can go into, and we're going to do that as we get into each individual area and domain. But tendons and ligaments both exhibit poor healing responses. Ligaments, if, if tendons uh, uh, heal slowly, ligaments even more so. But now they're non contractile. They function to bind bones together. So there's an element of, of static stability uh, when they're damaged, we lose normal kinematic relationships and possibly even arthrokinematic relationships. Uh, age, hormone, load, very similar factors that affect the risk of injury to what we've seen in others. Of note, exercise appears to increase ligament strength and stiffness, but we don't exactly know the mechanism. So that's yet again, a reason for why rehabilitation and exercise and training is a factor of importance. Now, similar to muscle, we have three grades. Okay, different though in terms of how we approach this. So, for example, a ligament that has a grade one pathology has a mild injury. Some stretching has occurred. There's not a lot of swelling. There's no abnormal motion. There's no laxity. There's no loss of function. When we get to a grade two, now this is different, right? Tearing and separation does occur, pain begins to build. We get effusion and stiffness. We need to protect the joint and the area around the ligament. And now laxity begins to occur. By the time we get to a grade three, we've completely ruptured the ligament. There's profuse swelling, possibly bruising. Range of motion is abnormal. Laxity is significant. And now we're probably looking at either a permanent loss of function or the need for surgical consideration. Again, ligaments don't heal well. Whereas we saw these three phases that were overlapping with tendons, here we have four. So there's a hemorrhagic response, bleeding response that leads to inflammatory response. Then we get proliferative and remodeling responses. They don't have a great blood supply. And so it's going to take a long time for healing to occur. Now, where they are located does help them a little bit. If they're intraarticular ligaments, not so great. If they're extraarticular ligaments, a little bit better, but it's still going to take a while. They still have to go through those phases. Since we're talking about intra versus extraarticular, let's also talk about the joints. What happens when we injure a joint? What happens when we um, uh, end up compromising the integrity of the joint, possibly through a ligamentous pathology? Well, we can end up with one of two things. Joint motion becomes compromised, and we can end up with hypomobility or hypermobility. Hypo is less than optimal movement, and it can be due to macro trauma, abnormal end fields, uh, scar tissue formation, swelling. Hypermobility is what happens when there's too much. There's laxity. Maybe that's generalized laxity because of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Maybe it's laxity because of a macro traumatic event or repetition of a micro traumatic event. Either way, joint motion is going to be compromised. And when joint motion becomes compromised, the joint becomes unstable. And there's the potential for real pathology. We need a, an, an appropriate amount of motion. Injury often occurs when there's either too much or too little motion that's available. And that leads to then involvement of the cartilage. And when the cartilage begins to be involved, now the risk of injury increases for that tissue. So when we're talking about injury for cartilage, recognize that cartilage also heals very poorly. Remember, we're going down that cascade. Bone heals really, really good. That's going to be the last thing that we talk about here in just a moment, um, in addition to neural tissue, right? But tendon, ligament, and cartilage don't heal well. Why? 
because you need a strong blood supply. And due to perichondrium, we don't have a good blood supply. It's lacking. And so when cartilage is injured, the repair process doesn't go super well. There's significant defects are not successfully repaired in most cases due to the blood supply, due to poor inflammatory response, and due to the extent of injury. If injury extends into the subchondral bone, it results in better repair. However, over time, that repair is going to degenerate because it's not a regeneration. It's a repair. We don't go back to hyaline cartilage. We go back to fibrocartilage. Very different. And injuries within the subchondral bone utilize what's known as the tide mark as an indicator of whether or not this is going to be a better healing response or a poor healing response. Because once we get beyond the tide mark, poor blood supply. What does that mean? Well, if we're in the superficial zone, that's our gliding surface, our transitional zone, and even our deep zone of hyaline cartilage, right? Um, we can get repair in those cases. Now, again, it's not going to be regeneration. It's not going to come back to hyaline cartilage. Once hyaline cartilage is gone, it's gone. But we can at least get fiber cartilage back. Once we move beyond that tide mark and we get down to subchondral bone, it's not coming back. There's a very poor blood supply. We're going to end up with scar tissue. And that's what occurs with osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is common. It's also progressive. It progresses to the subchondral bone, which is then going to become thicker and denser. And then that leads to what we refer to as depression in pits on the surface of the bone. Again, subchondral bone, once that becomes visible, once the injury ex exists past the tide mark to the subchondral bone, the hyaline cartilage is gone. It's absent. And it's at this point that function really begins to be limited. The joint capsule is going to get thicker. The synovium is going to thicken. Chronic inflammation is present. This is typically when we're talking about joint replacements. Now, up to this point, we've said tendons, slow healing process. Ligaments, slow healing process. Cartilage, slow healing process. Bone, on the other hand, great healing process. Mostly. We'll talk about why that is. Bone heals better than any other tissue of the body. Has a great blood supply. Typically. If you end up with a compound fracture and you don't have a lot of other risk factors and a whole lot of other issues, you're going to go through inflammation, granulation, tissue formation, callus is going to form, you're going to remodel and consolidate, and boom, you're going to be out of the cast and back to whatever the activity is in six to eight weeks. Maybe slightly longer if you have um, a confounding variable, but for the most part, it's going to heal well. Now, what about a stress fracture? Well, a stress fracture. It's also known as a BSI, bone stress injury, results from a low load, longer period, micro-traumatic event. High load, short period, you took a blow that was a shear force blow perpendicular to the bone, fracture occurs, macro-traumatic event, high load, short period. Bone stress injury over a period of time typically occurs to cancel this bone. Now we have low load, longer period. This is anything from stress reaction bony marrow edema, stress fracture, and those occur in some pretty predictable areas that are high risk. Great article by Ten Forty and colleagues out of Harvard University in 2016 looked at our high risk areas. Where do they occur? Femoral neck, the patella, anterior tibial diaphysis, the medial malleolus, the talus. Um, we might even throw the navicular in there. SI, pelvis. We start to get into medium, femoral shaft, proximal tibia, cuboid, cuneiform, calcaneus. Notice the foot has a lot in here. And then low would be posterior medial tibia, uh, lateral malleolus, the calcaneus, and even the diaphysis of the second and fourth met. These are all areas where we can see a bone stress injury, which is a cascade. It's things from bony marrow edema to a stress reaction, stress response, all the way up to full-blown stress fracture. Now, compound bone, uh, compound fractures uh, within bone, they heal very, very well. Stress reactions, a lot more play. And again, we'll talk about that. This is really meant to be an introduction, but we'll talk about that more as we go throughout the semesters.
So as we begin to wrap this up, some things to keep in mind as it relates to injury and immobilization, rehabilitation and performance bone with injury, it weakens. How do we rehab it? We expose it to load, compressive forces to increase density and strength and to take advantage of Wolf's law and the specific adaptation to impose demand. Ligaments. We got decreased cross linkage, similar to tendons and tensile strength. How do we bring about changes? We progressively load it. Muscle, loss of sarcomeres, loss of cross linkage, decreased contractile proteins. How do we rehabilitate it and bring about performance? We progressively load it. Cartilage, proteoglycan concentration decreases and swelling increases. How do we rehabilitate it? We lower the load throughout the range of motion. So all of these, with the exception of cartilage, require the exposure of load. Again, load is not the issue. Rather, it's the load that you're unprepared for. As a general healing consideration, whether it's DOMS, cartilage, tendon, muscle, ligament, bone, you see that on the right-hand side of your screen. Muscle, pretty good. Ligament, ooh, not so good. Tendon, depends on what it is. Bone, depends on what it is. If it's atraumatic, bone stress injury, it's going to take a little bit longer. But hopefully this gives you a little bit of a framework by which to appreciate different tissues and their overall tolerance to injury and the healing cascade. Ultimately, the question that probably was within your mind at this point is, how in the world then do we modify the risk for injury of any of these? As I just showed you, load is necessary in all but one. And even in cartilage, load is there. It's just that we're modifying and changing the way that load is experienced. Load is necessary for adaptation. When load exceeds the ability of the body's adaptability process, our risk goes up. We have a maladaptive response. When load is too little to foster and facilitate adequate adaptation, our risk goes up. It's maladaptive. We need a balance. And what we're going to do over the next two semesters is discuss what that balance looks like, how to craft it, how to foster it, how to facilitate it as it relates to injuries of the extremities, upper and lower, and the spine. A couple references for your consideration. Again, if you're looking to uh, gain a little bit more clarity or review concepts that may not be familiar, um, you can certainly look at Raymond's text. Uh, he provides a great overview uh, for individuals, um, and uh, that begins on page uh, 37. Additionally, many of these concepts should be concepts that you're familiar with, you've been exposed to, uh, whether that is in an undergraduate uh, exercise science or biology uh, education, or even within anatomy and um, related coursework. So uh, I hope this provides, uh, again, a refresher and begins to add some context as it relates to the clinical application of tissue pathology properties, and overall healing cascade.